Section 22 of Winesburg, Ohio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Miguel Rodriguez. Winesburg, Ohio by Sherwood Anderson. Section 22. Drink Concerning Tom Foster. Tom Foster came to Winesburg from Cincinnati when he was still young and could get many new impressions. His grandmother had been raised on a farm near the town, and as a young girl had gone to school there, when Winesburg was a village of twelve or fifteen houses, clustered about a general store on the Trunion Pike. What a life the old woman had led since she went away from the frontier settlement, and what a strong, capable little old thing she was. She had been in Kansas, in Canada, and in New York City, traveling about with her husband, a mechanic, before he died. Later, she went to stay with her daughter, who had also married a mechanic and lived in Covington, Kentucky, across the river from Cincinnati. Then began the hard years for Tom Foster's grandmother. First, her son-in-law was killed by a policeman during a strike, and then Tom's mother became an invalid and died also. The grandmother had saved a little money, but it was swept away by the illness of the daughter and by the cost of the two funerals. She became a half-worn-out old woman worker and lived with the grandson above a junk shop on a side street in Cincinnati. For five years, she scrubbed the floors in an office building and then got a place as a dishwasher in a restaurant. Her hands were all twisted out of shape, but she took hold of a mop or a broom handle the hands looked like the dried stems of an old creeping vine clinging to a tree. The old woman came back to Winesburg as soon as she got the chance. One evening, as she was coming home from work, she found a pocketbook containing thirty-seven dollars, and that opened the way. The trip was a great adventure for the boy. It was past seven o'clock at night when the grandmother came home with the pocketbook held tightly in her old hands, and she was so excited she could scarcely speak. She insisted on leaving Cincinnati that night, saying that if they stayed until morning, the owner of the money would be sure to find them out and make trouble. Tom, who was then sixteen years old, had to go trudging off to the station with the old woman, bearing all of their earthly belongings done up in a worn-out blanket and slung across his back. By his side walked the grandmother, urging him forward. Her toothless old mouth twitched nervously. And, when Tom grew weary and wanted to put the pack down at a street crossing, she snatched it up, and if he had not prevented, would have slung it across her own back. When they got into the train and it had run out of the city, she was as delighted as a girl and talked as the boy had never heard her talk before. All through the night as the train rattled along, the grandmother told Tom tales of Winesburg and of how he would enjoy his life working in the fields and shooting wild things in the woods there. She could not believe that the tiny village of fifty years before had grown into a thriving town in her absence, and in the morning when the train came to Winesburg, did not want to get off. It isn't what I thought. It may be hard for you here, she said. And then the train went on its way, and the two stood confused, not knowing where to turn in the presence of Albert Longworth, the Winesburg baggage master. But Tom Foster did get along all right. He was one to get along anywhere. Mrs. White, the banker's wife, employed his grandmother to work in the kitchen, and he got a place as stable boy in the banker's new brick barn. In Winesburg, servants were hard to get. The woman who wanted help in her housework employed a hired girl, who insisted on sitting at the table with the family. Mrs. White was sick of hired girls and snatched at the chance to get hold of the old city woman. She furnished a room for the boy Tom upstairs in the barn. He can mow the lawn and run errands when the horses do not need attention, she explained to her husband. Tom Foster was rather small for his age and had a large head covered with stiff black hair that stood straight up. The hair emphasized the bigness of his head. His voice was the softest thing imaginable, and he was himself so gentle and quiet that he slipped into the life of the town 
without attracting the least bit of attention. One could not help wondering where Tom Foster got his gentleness. In Cincinnati, he had lived in a neighborhood where gangs of tough boys prowled through the streets, and all through his early formative years he ran about with tough boys. For a while, he was a messenger for a telegraph company, and delivered messages in the neighborhood sprinkled with houses of prostitution. The women in the houses knew and loved Tom Foster, and the tough boys in the gangs loved him also. He never asserted himself. That was one thing that helped him escape. In an odd way, he stood in the shadow of the wall of life, was meant to stand in the shadow. He saw the men and women in the houses of lust, sensed their casual and horrible love affairs, saw boys fighting and listened to their tales of thieving and drunkenness, unmoved and strangely unaffected. Once Tom did steal. That was while he still lived in the city. The grandmother was ill at the time, and he himself was out of work. There was nothing to eat in the house, and so he went into a harness shop on a side street and stole a dollar and seventy-five cents out of the cash drawer. The harness shop was run by an old man with a long mustache. He saw the boy lurking about and thought nothing of it. When he went out into the street to talk to a teamster, Tom opened the cash drawer and, taking the money, walked away. Later he was caught, and his grandmother settled the matter by offering to come twice a week for a month and scrub the shop. The boy was ashamed, but he was rather glad, too. It is all right to be ashamed, and makes me understand new things, he said to the grandmother, who didn't know what the boy was talking about, but she loved him so much that it didn't matter whether she understood or not. For a year Tom Foster lived in the banker's stable, and then lost his place there. He didn't take very good care of the horses, and he was a constant source of irritation to the banker's wife. She told him to mow the lawn, and he forgot. Then she sent him to the store, or to the post office, and he did not come back but joined a group of men and boys, and spent the whole afternoon with them, standing about, listening, and occasionally, when addressed, saying a few words. As in the city, in the houses of prostitution, and with rowdy boys running through the streets at night, so in Winesburg among the citizens, he had always the power to be part of, and yet distinctly apart from the life about him. After Tom lost his place at Banker White's, he did not live with his grandmother, although often in the evening she came to visit him. He rented a room at the rear of a little frame building belonging to old Rufus White. The building was on Duane Street, just off Main Street, and had been used for years as a law office by the old man, who had become too feeble and forgetful for the practice of his profession, but did not realize his inefficiency. He liked Tom, and let him have the room for a dollar a month. In the late afternoon, when the lawyer had gone home, the boy had the place to himself, and spent hours lying on the floor by the stove and thinking of things. In the evening, the grandmother came and sat in the lawyer's chair to smoke a pipe, while Tom remained silent, as he always did in the presence of everyone. Often, the old woman talked with great vigor. Sometimes she was angry about some happening at the banker's house, and scolded away for hours. Out of her own earnings, she bought a mop, and regularly scrubbed the lawyer's office. Then, when the place was spotlessly clean, and smelled clean, she lighted her clay pipe, and she and Tom had a smoke together. When you get ready to die, then I will die also, she said to the boy, lying on the floor beside her chair. Tom Foster enjoyed life in Winesburg. He did odd jobs, such as cutting wood for kitchen stoves and mowing the grass before houses. In late May and early June, he picked strawberries in the fields. He had time to loaf, and he enjoyed loafing. Banker White had given him a cast-off coat which was too large for him, but his grandmother cut it down, and he also had an overcoat, got at the same place, that was lined with fur. The fur was worn away in spots, but the coat was warm, and in the winter Tom slept in it. He thought his method of getting along good enough, and was happy and satisfied with the way life in Winesburg had turned out for him. The most absurd little things made Tom Foster happy. That, I suppose, was why people loved him. 
In Hearn's grocery, they would be roasting coffee on Friday afternoon, preparatory to the Saturday rush of trade, and the rich odor invaded Lower Main Street. Tom Foster appeared and sat on the box at the rear of the store. For an hour, he did not move, but sat perfectly still, filling his being with a spicy odor that made him half drunk with happiness. I like it, he said gently. It makes me think of things far away, places and things like that. One night, Tom Foster got drunk. That came about in a curious way. He never had been drunk before, and indeed in all his life had never taken a drink of anything intoxicating. But he felt he needed to be drunk that one time, and so went and did it. In Cincinnati, when he lived there, Tom had found out many things. Things about ugliness and crime and lust. Indeed, he knew more of these things than anyone else in Winesburg. The matter of sex in particular had presented itself to him in a quite horrible way and had made a deep impression on his mind. He thought, after what he had seen of the women standing before the squalid houses on cold nights and the look he had seen in the eyes of the men who stopped to talk to him, that he would put sex altogether out of his own life. One of the women of the neighborhood tempted him once, and he went into a room with her. He never forgot the smell of the room, nor the greedy look that came into the eyes of the woman. It sickened him, and in a very terrible way left a scar on his soul. He had always before thought of women as quite innocent things, much like his grandmother. But after that one experience in the room, he dismissed women from his mind. So gentle was his nature that he could not hate anything, and not being able to understand, he decided to forget. And Tom did forget until he came to Winesburg. After he had lived there for two years, something began to stir in him. On all sides, he saw youth making love, and he was himself a youth. Before he knew what had happened, he was in love also. He fell in love with Helen White, daughter of the man for whom he had worked, and found himself thinking of her at night. That was a problem for Tom, and he settled it in his own way. He let himself think of Helen White whenever her figure came into his mind, and only concerned himself with the manner of his thoughts. He had a fight, a quiet, determined little fight of his own, to keep his desires in the channel where he thought they belonged. But on the whole, he was victorious. And then came the spring night when he got drunk. Tom was wild on that night. He was like an innocent young buck of the forest that has eaten of some maddening weed. The thing began, ran its course, and was ended in one night. And you may be sure that no one in Winesburg was any the worse for Tom's outbreak. In the first place, the night was one to make a sensitive nature drunk. The trees along the resident streets of the town were all newly clothed in soft green leaves. In the gardens behind the houses, men were puttering about in vegetable gardens, and in the air there was a hush, a waiting kind of silence, very stirring to the blood. Tom left his room on Duane Street, just as the young night began to make itself felt. First he walked through the streets, going softly and quietly along, thinking thoughts that he tried to put into words. He said that Helen White was a flame dancing in the air, and that he was a little tree without leaves, standing out sharply against the sky. Then he said that she was a wind, a strong, terrible wind, coming out of the darkness of a stormy sea, and that he was a boat left on the shore of the sea by a fisherman. That idea pleased the boy, and he sauntered along playing with it. He went into Main Street and sat on the curbing before Wacker's tobacco store. For an hour he lingered about, listening to the talk of men. But it did not interest him much, and he slipped away. Then he decided to get drunk, and went into Willie's saloon and bought a bottle of whiskey. Putting the bottle into his pocket, he walked out of town, wanting to be alone to think more thoughts and to drink the whiskey. Tom got drunk sitting on a bank of new grass beside the road about a mile north of town. Before him was a white road, and at his back an apple orchard in full bloom. He took a drink out of the bottle, and then lay down on the grass. 
He thought of mornings in Winesburg, and of how the stones in the graveled driveway by Banker White's house were wet with dew and glistened in the morning light. He thought of the nights in the barn when it rained, and he lay awake hearing the drumming of the raindrops and smelling the warm smell of horses and of hay. Then he thought of a storm that had gone roaring through Winesburg several days before, and, his mind going back, he relived the night he had spent on the train with his grandmother when the two were coming from Cincinnati. Sharply he remembered how strange it had seemed to sit quietly in the coach and to feel the power of the engine hurling the train along through the night. Tom got drunk in a very short time. He kept taking drinks from the bottle as the thoughts visited him, and when his head began to reel, got up and walked along the road, going away from Winesburg. There was a bridge on the road that ran out of Winesburg North to Lake Erie, and the drunken boy made his way along the road to the bridge. There he sat down. He tried to drink again, but when he had taken the cork out of the bottle, he became ill and put it quickly back. His head was rocking back and forth, and so he sat on the stone approach to the bridge and sighed. His head seemed to be flying about like a pinwheel, and then projecting itself off into space, and his arms and legs flopped helplessly about. At eleven o'clock, Tom got back into town. George Willard found him wandering about, and took him into the Eagle Print Shop. Then he became afraid that the drunken boy would make a mess on the floor, and helped him into the alleyway. The reporter was confused by Tom Foster. The drunken boy talked of Helen White, and he said he had been with her on the shore of a sea and had made love to her. George had seen Helen White walking in the street with her father during the evening and decided that Tom was out of his head. A sentiment concerning Helen White that lurked in his own heart flamed up, and he became angry. Now you quit that, he said. I won't let Helen White's name be dragged into this. I won't let that happen. He began shaking Tom's shoulder, trying to make him understand. You quit it he said again. For three hours, the two young men, thus strangely thrown together, stayed in the print shop. When he had a little recovered, George took Tom for a walk. They went into the country and sat on a log near the edge of a wood. Something in the still night drew them together, and when the drunken boy's head began to clear, they talked. It was good to be drunk, Tom Foster said. It taught me something. I won't have to do it again. I will think more dearly after this. You see how it is. George Willard did not see, but his anger concerning Helen White passed, and he felt drawn toward the pale, shaken boy, as he had never before been drawn toward anyone. With motherly solicitude, he insisted that Tom get to his feet and walk about. Again they went back to the print shop and sat in silence in the darkness. The reporter could not get the purpose of Tom Foster's actions straightened out in his mind. When Tom spoke again of Helen White, he again grew angry and began to scold. You quit that, he said sharply. You haven't been with her. What makes you say you have? What makes you keep saying such things? Now you quit it, do you hear? Tom was hurt. He couldn't quarrel with George Willard because he was incapable of quarreling. So he got up to go away. When George Willard was insistent, he put out his hand, laying it on the older boy's arm, and tried to explain. Well, he said softly, I don't know how it was. I was happy. You see how that was. Helen White made me happy, and the night did too. I wanted to suffer, to be hurt somehow. I thought that was what I should do. I wanted to suffer, you see, because everyone suffers and does wrong. I thought of a lot of things to do, but they wouldn't work. They all hurt someone else. Tom Foster's voice arose, and for once in his life he became almost excited. It was like making love, that's what I mean, he explained. Don't you see how it is? It hurt me to do what I did and made everything strange. That's why I did it. I'm glad, too. It taught me something. That's it. That's what I wanted. Don't you understand? I wanted to learn things, you see. That's why I did it. End of section 22. Recording by Miguel Rodriguez. Towson, Maryland.